The next speaker is uh, Dr. Luana Coloca from the United States of America. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely pleased to introduce uh, Luana because she's one of the most brilliant and original young scientists in the field of uh, pain research in humans. And uh, we are also very proud in uh, ethic because uh, Luana, uh, at the starting of uh, her uh, independent career, was uh, one of the uh, recipient of uh, EFIC Grunenthal uh, grant, which uh, you know, as you know now, support the uh, young scientist in early career. But now Dr. Luana Coloca uh, became one of the leading scientists in the world for the study of pain modulation mechanism and placebo effects. Luana received her PhD from the University of Catanzaro Medical School in Italy and holds a master's degree in bioethics and a PhD in neuroscience from the University of Torino in Italy. Then Luana completed a postdoc training at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden, and a senior research fellowship at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda in the USA. Luana's research goal is to provide a comprehensive approach to understanding pain experience and modulation by incorporating pharmacological, functional, behavioral and psychophysical information directly in humans. Uh, the developed approach are pivotal in translating knowledge about pain modulation from human laboratory settings to patients and personalized medicine. Luana is the author of landmark publication and is considered a key international figure in placebo research. Yeah, it is also worth noting that she has received important international honor, several research grants, and co-edited uh, three books on neurobiological and translational aspects of placebo effects. So please, uh, Luana, uh, could you come and show us your uh, uh, exciting and original research, please? Thank you very much. It's, I'm very pleased to be to, here today and present part of our results. In particular, I'm going to talk about placebo mechanism and uh, translational aspects. That is very much what we are trying to learn from this meeting. So just to start, I'm going to provide a definition of placebo and placebo effects, explain a few studies show the placebo mechanism as well as the translational aspects, and I choose also the nocebo aspect because it's quite relevant for translating what we learn in lab in clinical practice. And finally, I want to present some very recent exciting results about the possibility to manipulate placebo effects pharmacologically to enhance the benefit in relief pain. So when we talk about placebo, many of us have an idea. In particular, when I mention placebo, I'm quite sure that our synapses think about sugar pill, talc pill, inert substance, because this is very much the reality of clinical trials. Indeed, in clinical trials, we can talk about placebo responses, and we define as placebo responses change that occur because of bias. For example, the experimenter as well as uh, the patient may report less pain to please us. Regression to the mean as well as natural history, pain can decrease or increase and the co-interventions. So that is a quite uh, a, a specific way to talk about placebo and this is what we observe daily in clinical trials. So in the absence of a no treatment arm, we can't really define the placebo effect. So then let me talk about the placebo effect. When we talk uh, from a neuroscientific point of view about the placebo effect, we, we refer very much to an endogenous 
modulator systems. And we don't need placebo to define this phenomenon. Indeed, we can observe a placebo component in any treatment. Every time you use a painkiller, you can see a decrease of pain as a result of the specific pharmacodynamic component, as well as the combination of the expectation pathway. And that is where we learn about our brain and how our brain and our emotions and our learning mechanism can modulate clinical pain outcomes. So just to define, in laboratory setting, when we study the placebo phenomenon, we are able to disentangle neurobiological and clinical changes that result from patient perception, expectations, prior experience, as well as the th therapeutic encounter. And often, we include a no-treatment group allow us to define the placebo effects from a neurobiological point of view. But why does this research matter? So as you know, pain affects a large number of patients worldwide, leading at least in the States to an estimate cost of about 600 billion annually. And what is interesting, if we look at thousands of painkillers, they are discharged after phase second, third clinical trials because they do not outperform placebos. In 2011, clinical trials.gov listed more than 4,000 pain clinical trials, and yet today, in four years, there were only five new approvals. And all these five new approvals are existing drugs in new formulation in dosage forms. So you can understand that translating mechanistic uh, uh, results into clinical practice, clinical trial, it's extremely important. So probably many of you are familiar with this model where for translating the results, we need to start from the discover of basic science. And for placebo, many of our findings came from study in normal participants, health volunteers, as well as in patients. And the goal is to try to shift from uh, um, stage T0, T1, to T3 and hopefully in the future T4, where we can uh, translate what we learn in the lab into clinical practice. So to study placebo analgesia, we create a very simple model in the lab where we simulate an expectancy of a benefit. As you can see from the picture, our participants, mostly MD students, were receiving a painful stimuli to the dorsum of their hand, and they were alerted that every time they were going to receive pain, there is a red light alerting about the occurrence of a quite high level of pain. At the same moment, we apply a sham electrode, and we told them that every time this electrode will be activated, they would perceive less pain. And to make them uh, you know, aware and eventually condition them, we use another cue, a green light. And for several trials, we call this acquisition phase, conditioning phase, we reduce the intensity of the pain every time we show the green light so that our participants reinforce their expectation of analgesia. And they were experiencing, and I would like to stress these two words, reinforcing expectation experience through pain, no pain, pain, no pain, several times. And I think that is a little bit what it can happen in uh, clinical settings as well. For the testing run, this seems a difficult word, but it's merely the phase when we want to look at placebo analgesic responses. So we turn uh, all the level of pain at the same intensity, and we were assessing pain report, behaviorally the effects of a preconditioning on the experience of pain. As you can see, we include a no treatment group to exclude that merely observing different colors, like green and light cues, produce modulation of pain, and you can see there is no change. When uh, we study the group that first experienced pain, no pain, several times, and then we turn the level of pain exactly at the same intensity, you can see that the green associate stimuli were perceived as less painful. That is what we call uh, 
expectancy induced analgesia, reinforced induced analgesia, and uh, uh, it's very interesting to try to understand more about the mechanism of this kind of analgesia that actually persists after about one week in this study, but we are running also additional study to see how long this kind of effects can last. To reinforce the concept of learning and uh, how experience matters, we design a very simple uh, experiment where we change the number of conditioning trials. And you can see that 10 pairings, so 10 associations between red and uh, green cues, produce a very small and uh, extinguishing placebo analgesic effect. Conversely, if we extend this period of acquisition experience, you can see that the magnitude of placebo analgesia increases significantly. So we then reinforce the idea that learning is a crucial component. And we want to use this paradigm to try to understand a little bit more about this phenomenon, to what extent our beliefs and expectation or more conditioning and subconscious mechanism. So we use, this design seems a little complex, but we use exactly the same paradigm with one session, day one, of conditioning and four sessions of conditioning where they experience a reduction of pain. And then for the testing phase in another day, we actually inform participants that the cream we use was merely a placebo. And we want to randomize our participants somewhere informed about the use of a placebo cream before the testing phase and some other after. And what is interesting, if we are exposed to a long conditioning, you can see that the results from free revealal show that the long conditioning again produces robust placebo analgesia. But what is more interesting, if you look at this part of our graph post reveal, the conditioning, the long conditioning, produce long-lasting analgesic effects that actually persist after being told that the cream was merely a placebo. But when we look at the short conditioning and we inform participants that the cream was a sham treatment, actually there is hyperalgesic. So that is to say how important is prior experience in triggering this kind of effect. And while we use classical conditioning recently, we want to create another model to try to simulate what we observe in clinics. Sometimes treatment works very well, some other time do not work. So we introduce a partial reinforcement where our manipulation, reduction of analgesia to produce a sensation of pain relief occurs once in a while. And we want to compare classical conditioning with partial conditioning. And you can see from the graph in yellow and orange that there was no difference. But what is interesting, when we look at the trial by trial time course, you can see that the conditioning produce l classical conditioning, larger placebo analgesic effects at the beginning of the trial, but then eventually these effects extinguish. Conversely, when we use a partial reinforcement, whereby sometimes we show placebo, uh, a reduction of pain, some other time, no, you can see that there is no extinction of this effect. So, what is interesting, this kind of behavioral observation recently have been explored with the powerful brain imaging techniques, and there are many studies that we summarize in this review, show that it's very important to activate frontal area to modulate in a top-down way the nociceptive input. And briefly, I want to show just a few studies about the possibility to target this kind of phenomenon from a brain point of view. In this case, we use laser evocated potential to study placebo analgesia after conditioning or after verbal instruction of analgesia. And you can see that what we call laser potentials are both modulate, although conditioning is much stronger in producing analgesia. Interestingly, if we use the same paradigm in the scan and we want to explore again the neuron correlates of placebo analgesia, 
uh, we can uh, learn more about this phenomenon. So you are familiar now with this model of visual cues, pre-exposure to analgesia, and then uh, analysis of um, placebo analgesic effects. In this case, we use a laser and we study the brain responses after the stimulus. You can see that area of the pain network are crucially modulated. Let's zoom at least one area, the right insula. You can see that although participants receive exactly the same level of pain during the test run, the bold response is completely different. There is a decrease of brain activity when participants believe that they are going to receive analgesic responses. What was exciting is that if we look at the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the activity in this area correlates strongly with placebo effects, in particular with individual placebo responses. And this is a concept that has been replicated by many of my colleagues. So, so far I talk about manipulating pain intensity to provide a mastery of pain relief. But we can also condition participants through pharmacological approach. For example, in this case, we use a, a model of tonic pain, what we call tourniquet. And participants were receiving morphine on day two, day three, and after two administration of morphine, we provide placebo. You can see that the pain tolerance measured in minutes, this participant were going to tolerate pain, increase after morphine as compared to two controls, day one and day five. So it seems that there is also a pharmacological memory whereby our brain, our body, can learn to mimic the action of a drug like morphine to produce analgesia. And it's interesting if we randomize our participants and we use naloxone, this kind of effect is blocked. That means that and, and the mechanism underlying this phenomenon is related to the opioid system. So by looking at these results, the natural question for clinicians, physicians can be, then we should use placebo in clinical practice. We don't know yet if we can use placebo after pharmacological conditioning, but for now, I would suggest do not administer placebos, especially if that require inclusion of deception, rather, try to learn how can we use placebo mechanism to endorse and improve clinical outcome. And I want to just to show this study that actually it's the first study I've run when I was a PhD student immediately after my MD. So we were studying patient post thoractomy and the goal was to try to understand the contribution of expectancy in modulating clinical outcomes. So we use morphine, 10 milligram, and you can see that there is this cartoon with um, a patient attached to a pump of infusion managing the delivery of morphine or an IV where an health provider was approaching the patient and informing about the administration of morphine. So merely changing this contest produced a huge difference in pain relief. You can see we measure pain intensity and uh, in blue is the a open administration of morphine. You can see that there is a relapse of pain that is much faster than a hidden administration. What is interesting is that it's not true merely for painkillers, but also for other treatment. Patients in the post-operative setting receive diazepam, and you can see that diazepam, given in an open fashion, produces a very significant reduction of anxiety. But if we use the same dose, the same treatment, without uh, informing our participant, without the clinical interaction with the physician, the action of the diazepam was not significant at all. And uh, we can think about the implication of this kind of effect. And the rest of my talk is based on uh, nocebo effects. Nocebo effects are the bad twins of a placebo, the opposite how can we form a negative expectancy when actually we produce 
negative effects related either to unsuccessful experience or verbal anticipation of the possibility to experience more pain. So in this case, we want very much to simulate a situation where a patient can produce allodinic or hyperalgesic effects. But again, we were in the lab using the same model that you know now. And we used low tactile, high tactile, and low painful stimuli. But indeed, participants were told that they were going to receive high level of pain. And this um, allowed us to try to understand if we can produce allodinic and hyperalgesic effects in the lab. After begin alert that our participants were going to receive eye pain, you can see that low tactile stimuli become painful, but also after begin exposed to high level of pain, there is an hyperalgesic or allodinic effect. But it's interesting when we look at either prior experience, begin exposed to high level of pain, or verbal anticipation of high level of pain, both produce similar outcomes. And that is quite different that we usually observe when we use verbal suggestions versus prior experience via conditioning with placebo. Indeed, it seems that to learn a benefit, we need to consolidate these effects through experience. Conversely, for nocebo effects, we don't need to experience so much. Merely beginning form can be so strong to modulate negatively pain perception. And that is another approach where we try to understand how crossover study can be biased by placebo analgesic effects and prior experience and negative effects as well. So we simulate a drug A effective and a drug B ineffective. And we switch the mm, sequence again in the lab. And if we start with a drug A, you can see that the pain reduction is quite impressive because we actually manipulate the setting to create a master of um, analgesia. And the drug, a placebo, ineffective, becomes effective after beginning exposed to um, powerful analgesic effects. But it's also true the opposite. If we start with a negative experience and then we receive exactly the same manipulation A, the result is quite different, much lower analgesia if we have a prior negative experience. So we want to learn more about that. And uh, um, it's interesting that this kind of observation find both the clinical results and the neuronal findings. So in this case, again, normal participants receive a single verbal suggestion of a pain and uh, the possibility to experience long-lasting hyperalgesia. So try to imagine a normal participant arriving to the lab and begin randomized to a control group where they were merely told we are going to study pain and in this case we are going to study pain day one, day eight, and day 90. And the contextual group receive a different information through the informed consent on day one only. And they were told Repeated pain over several days will increase your pain sensation over time from day to day. Merely begin inform about the possibility to experience during this uh, study participation increase of pain, change the time course. You can see that in blue, the control group habituate to pain. Conversely, there was no habituation when they were pre-informed about the occurrence of increased pain. And uh, it's interesting, this kind of change are not just behavioral change, but you can see that there is uh, an activation of the operculum. Based on these results, we review the literature and, um, well, we published some uh, systematic review. And uh, in this case, I want just to show one that impressed me. Uh, women were ready for labor and they were receiving epidural anesthesia and they were randomized to two different disclosures. Group one was told just before the injection to produce anesthesia, you are going to feel a big bee sting. This is the worst part of the procedure. Group two was told in a soft way, we are going to give you a local anesthetic that will numb the area and you will be comfortable during the procedure. I guess how many 
physicians and clinicians in the room use this very small uh, framing effects when they inform participants during an interventional procedure or just before any other surgical procedure. A blind uh, anesthesiologist enters into the room and you can see that group one informed in a quite open way receive uh, and perceive much more pain as compared to group two where there was an anticipation of a benefit together with uh, a truthful information related to the procedure. So small change in informed consent can make a difference in pain perception, clinically speaking. And that is also true if we use the open hidden paradigm that I mentioned to you. In this case, we stop the administration of morphine. And you can see that there is a huge difference if participants know that, in this case, patient in post-operative pain, know that we are going to stop morphine. You can see that when they know that morphine was stopped, there is an increase of pain. Conversely, if we stop morphine through the pump of the infusion without telling participants, there is still a quite good clinical management of pain. Based on uh, the review of the literature, lab results, we decided to write uh, a sort of uh, viewpoint where we suggest uh, to frame the informed consent to carefully balance truthful information and expectance empowerment. And also it's very much important to tailor the information delivered to the need of the patient and learn about their prior and sexual experience. And eventually we need to educate future health providers and maybe patients about the possibility to experience nocive effects related to clinical outcomes. In the last part of my talk, I wanted to try to think more about the psychosocial context and the neurobiology behind this kind of effects. Recently, I tried to understand more about the social component of placebo. First, because many of my colleagues used to talk about placebo effects as neurobiological change related to expectancy or conditioning learning mechanism. But that is not really a framework that can uh, explain the variety of uh, placebo effects occurring in clinical trials. And we started to study social learning, how merely observing a person without any prior experience, any conditioning, without verbal information, can eventually modulate pain. That was the, clinic, the experimental setting. We invite a demonstrator to show analgesia every time we show the green light and pain every time we show the red light. And after um, about 15 minutes of a simulation where the observer were watching the simulation, we first assess pain threshold for each individual and then we invite the demonstrator to leave the room and the participant was tested for placebo analgesia. By now you have learned that when we test for placebo analgesia, unfortunately we use some element of deception, and in this case the deceptive component was that pain was always painful, although they have been observed that green was paired with no pain. And you can see that there was a quite robust analgesic effect. Although these participants were receiving exactly the same level of pain, they perceived green associated stimuli as less painful. We wonder if this is merely an effect of empathy and social contagious. Probably not, because uh, in this case we run a, dissimilar, a very similar experiment, but we include a video. And it's interesting, when we observe a live demonstrator, placebo analgesic responses correlate strongly with empathy concern. But if we observe a demonstrator through a video without any interpersonal component, the empathy does not predict these effects anymore. So it seems that social observation learning play a crucial role more than um, empathy per se. And finally, Probably those who are familiar with placebo analgesia, they know that different systems are involved. And the goal was to try to understand again how can we enhance placebo by using agonists of 
an oxytocin and vasopressin receptor. So in this case, we want to use intranasal administration of vasopressin that has a quite interesting role in binding uh, uh, VA and V2 receptor in our brain and modulating across different species social behaviors. So in the room there was um, a clinician running the experiment. Our participants were first assessed for pain threshold and then they receive either vasopressin, saline, oxytocin or no treatment. And after about 45 minutes they were tested with the same paradigm. What we observe is that women show a very strong placebo analgesic effects under vasopressin, but this was not observed in men. And interestingly, women with lower anxiety or cortisol are those who respond better to this kind of interpersonal effects. So finally, just to conclude, placebo and nocebo effects depend upon the activation of pain modulator systems and release of endogenous opioids and non-opioids and neuropeptides. Placebo and nocebo findings provide a hint to explore pain modulator system and their relation with clinical trials and outcomes. And finally, placebo and nocebo research represent a unique tool to understand more and more about the neurobiological component of patient-doctor interaction. And in translating this knowledge, it's good to have tools like books where we summarize what we know so far and finally, thank you very much for your attention and I want to thank many of my colleagues across different countries I have the pleasure to work with as well as my group and uh, um, our uh, funding agencies. Thank you very much.